Okay, thank you very much. Just to introduce people, um, we have our summer interns seminars today, and we are going to have uh, three topics covered and uh, several presentations within some of those topics. So we're going to begin with Killian Murphy, who is going to tell us about heat kernel expansions on fuzzy spaces. So I will hand over to you, Killian. You are muted though. Uh, Gillian, you are muted. You are still muted. I think you, you unmuted the wrong screen. You, un you unmuted the laptop rather than the uh, lecture theater room. Can you hear me then, Yeah, now, the, now there is sound. There was no sound coming from the laptop. Okay, all right. Um, so, can you hear me okay? Let's now? officially begin with you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Killian. I'm going to my last year of studying physics with UCC and uh, this summer here with Dias uh, on the heat kernel expansion in both fuzzy spaces with um, the Kaki as my supervisor. Um, uh, so first I'll give an introduction on um, uh, just what fuzzy spaces are, what kernel expansion is, give, give um, just some motivation for studying fuzzy spaces and some examples of them. Um, so first of all, uh, a fuzzy space, or the basic idea from a fuzzy space comes from the duality between spaces and the algebra of functions, which can be defined on the space. And this algebra of functions, uh, of continuous functions, can be approximated by the algebra of n by n matrices. And this is algebra of n by n matrices, which then define what the fuzzy space. Um, the main difference between the algebra of functions on your regular space and your algebra of matrices is the algebra of functions is commutative, whereas the algebra of matrices is non commutative. But as the limit um, of the size of these matrices goes to infinity, the commutative property is uh, recoverable. Uh, as in the continuing case. So an example of um, a fuzzy space is the fuzzy uh, two sphere. This is just your unit sphere in R3, and it's described by three global real coordinates, mm -hmm. uh, X1, X2, and X3, where these coordinates satisfy the two properties that the sum of the squares equals one and the Poisson bracket of um, the coordinates on the spaces uh, given as such, where this is the Levy Savita symbol. Um, then fuzzy, the fuzzy Q sphere is described by three N minus Hermitian matrices uh, instead of three real coordinates. And, and these are given as such, these XI uh, matrices, where this LI is an N dimensional irreducible representation of the SU2 Lie algebra. And these uh, matrices satisfy the, or the condition that the sum of the squares equal the identity matrix. And then with the that commutator instead of the Poisson bracket. And we can see that the structure of this is very similar to the structure of the Poisson bracket on the regular two sphere. And in the limit of N1 to infinity, um, this will also go to zero. So the matrices. Uh, commute in this layer n limit. So fuzzy spaces are a pretty abstract idea, but there is some uh, motivation for studying them. Um, what I mean is that space time was described by a smooth manifold, but 
at the plan scale, this description is no longer sufficient. Um, and fuzzy spaces or and non commutable spaces provide a way to describe space time at the low distance scale. And it's hoped by formulating Euclidean gravity on fuzzy spaces that they may provide a new approach to theory of quantum gravity. Um, and that brings up the question how can gravity actually be formulated on these spaces, uh, on these fuzzy spaces? And it comes down to needing some matrix object, which in the large and limit will recover the Einstein Hilbert action in the continuum case. Um, and approach using this project and next was to use a heat kernel expansion on these fuzzy spaces to aid in its formulation of gravity. Um, the next one actually is the heat kernel expansion. And this is first defined by defining uh, a Laplace Beltrami operator, which is defined on a 2D uh, dimensional Riemannian manifold with some metric tensor G near new. And then the LV operator is given in terms of the metric and its derivatives. And so then using this operator, we define this heat kernel operator, which is just the LV operator exponentiated and multiplied by some parameter T. And when we take the trace of this operator and consider the limit as T equal to zero, we get this asymptotic expansion um, where these coefficients A0 and A2 are geometric uh, quantities uh, of this space uh, being considered. So A0 is proportional to the volume of the manifold and A2 is proportional to the uh, Einstein Hilbert action of the manifold. And we can give an example of this again using the unit, uh, unit sphere. So the LV operator on S2 with standard metric um, g theta theta like the one and g by five sine squared theta, um, we can have an explicit or write an explicit expression for this operator. And this is eigenvalues of L by L plus one, and each eigenvalue has a corresponding multiplicity at two L plus one. And here L goes from zero to infinity. Um, Using this operator, we then take the heat current expansion of or on uh, S2, where we expand the trace in terms of the eigenvalue and uh, degeneracy of the eigenvalues uh, of the space in question. And as an if uh, t goes to zero, we can see that, uh, or we can show that a0 equals one and a2 equals one over three. And these are in fact proportional to the, to the volume and Einstein. Hilbert action in this space. Uh, and so over the course of the project, um, we've evaluated the key current expansion on several sub quasi spaces, both analytically and numerically. And this presentation uh, will discuss the key current expansion on one of these spaces, quasi uh, CP2, which is a complex projective space. And that's a four dimensions uh, quasi space, which is of uh, so somewhat bigger interest because it's four dimensional and space time is also uh, four dimensional. It's just an outline of the rest of the project. Mm -hmm. um, introduce the heat current expansion on fuzzy spaces. Um, define what CP2 and fuzzy CP2 is. Show the heat current expansion on fuzzy CP2. Give a summary of some possible future uh, work uh, using this method. <clears throat> So again, we'll just use this um, S2, fuzzy S2 example. So we can define uh, an LV operator on fuzzy S2 as shown uh, at the double commutator where the XA matrices are the matrices defined earlier. Um, and this can also be expressed more simply as the uh, LI matrices, the irreducible representation of a SU2 with the algebra. And importantly, this operator has the same eigenvalues L by L plus one and corresponding multiplicity two L plus one as in the continuum case. But um, in this case, L uh, ranges from zero to N minus one. So it has a, a finite product for a maximum uh, eigenvalue. And this shows up in our heat kernel where the sum is no longer infinite, but it's finite. It has its maximum uh, eigenvalue. 
And so in this case, it's only taking the limit as t going to zero that's not produced and asymptotic expansion as it does in the continuing case. To uh, recover an asymptotic expansion, you need a double scaling limit. Uh, when we need to consider the maximum eigenvalue uh, of the space. And for the case of quasi S2, this maximum eigenvalue is n by n minus one. And the double scaling limit requires that these three quantities, uh, n one over t and t times the maximum uh, eigenvalue all go to infinity. Um, and so for the case of quasi S2, if we let t be parameterized in terms of n and some other uh, remember alpha, alpha is between zero and one, the double scaling limit can be realized by only taking uh, one limit uh, of n going to infinity. And then uh, using the euler mclaurin formula, we, it allows us to rewrite the heat kernel of this quasi uh, S2 operator in such a way that we can evaluate it using the double scaling limit and using this method for quasi S2, we recover the uh, continuing case where A0 equals 1 and A2 equals 1 over 3. Just uh, if the idea of this double scaling limit is correct or general or general uh, quasi spaces, then we can expect that these quantities A0 and A2 can be uh, expressed in terms of matrices as shown. Uh, where again, A0 will be proportional to the volume of manifold and A2 proportional to the Einstein Hilbert action on the manifold. And here, this uh, delta M hat is the operator on the fuzzy approximation to your manifold and has the same uh, eigenvalues and multiplicity as the LV operator find on the uh, actual manifold, uh, with the only difference being this cutoff or maximum uh, eigenvalue on the fuzzy space. Now we'll move and focus on the convex projective space, CP2. So as I mentioned before, it's a four-dimensional manifold, um, and it can be defined as such for the, um, in terms of these P matrices, which are three by three uh, complex matrices, which are Hermitian, they're equal to their square, and they have a trace equal to one. Using these matrices, global coordinates XAs, or XAs, um, which are in orange can be defined using the expansion of these P matrices uh, as shown uh, with the Gelman, Man, Gelman matrices, lambda A form the basis for the SU3 B algebra. And these global coordinates on CP2 satisfy these three uh, relations. In the case of uh, S2, we only have a few relations here. It's a bit more complicated, or some of the squares is one over three. This last line with the Poisson bracket of the uh, coordinates um, being analogously the final in the SU case where FA, BC would be the structural constant for SU3 um, and is analogous to the Levy Savita symbol. And this term, um, new relation involved the D e tensor here, which is a uh, totally symmetric uh, tensor. And the chords then obey this third relation as well. Local coordinates Z alpha and Z alpha tangent can also be defined in CP2. And these are introduced by uh, expressing P in terms of the outer product of this normalized vector psi, as shown. And these local coordinates on CP2 are related to the global coordinates by this relation. We just take the trace of the P matrix by one of the Gelman matrices. Uh, using these local coordinates, we can find a, a Fubini Schini metric on CP2. And then it's given uh, like this in terms of the local coordinates. Once we have a metric on the space, we can then define the LV operator on CP2 in terms of this Fubini Schini metric. And it is given here. And importantly, this uh, operator has eigenvalues of L by L plus two with corresponding multiplicity uh, L plus one cubed. And again, here L goes from zero to infinity. 
allows us to define our heat kernel expansion on uh, CP2. And we can see that in this case, A0 and A2 are both equal to one half. Now I'll focus on uh, heat kernel expansion on the fuzzy complex projective space. And this fuzzy complex projective space is described by A Hermitian matrices instead of A uh, real coordinates. Uh, and these are just uh, some pre factor times this lambda matrix, where lambda is a one half by n plus one by n plus two dimensional irreducible representation of the SU3 Lie algebra. And these matrices satisfy these conditions, which are again uh, very similar to the conditions for C32. And in the large N limit, they do uh, recover the same uh, equations or relations. Next, we have to define an LB operator on CP2. And this is done much the same way as it was done for uh, fuzzy uh, S2 in terms of these global coordinates on uh, fuzzy CP2 XA, which is again just the double commutator of the, these lambda matrices. And this has eigenvalues L by L plus 2 and corresponding multiplicity L plus 1 cubed, the same as for the continuum case. Uh, except that these eigenvalues uh, have some maximum value uh, when L equals N. And again, the trace of this fuzzy CP2 has a maximum eigenvalue, so it's a finite sum instead of a or oh, instead of an infinite sum. Um, and we evaluate the sum in the double scaling limit. By, um, so first we rewrite the argument of the sum as such. And rewriting in this way allows us to apply the Euler Victorian formula to the sum. And that's what's shown here. So the sum gets split into an integral of f of x, f of x, and derivatives of f. And each of these terms can be evaluated uh, as shown here. And when we take the double scaling limit, uh, as it goes to infinity, we again recover the continuum case where A0 equals and A2 equals one. Uh, we also evaluated this these coefficient A0 and A2 numerically. So the expression given earlier for A0, uh, well, this we can see in the large element it does tend to uh, asymptote one half, which is agrees with the analytical expression. And the same is true for A2. Uh, again, in large N, it does tend to asymptote to the, what was found to be the analytical value. Uh, I can also evaluate this uh, heat kernel uh, numerically for fuzzy CP2 as it's a finite sum. And that's what's shown here. And the dash red line is just the asymptotic expansion for A0 and A2 equal to one half. And, and you can see that they are uh, a pretty good approximation of the series uh, in large N. Uh, so in this project, uh, I evaluated the heat current expansion on fuzzy CP2 using the double scaling limit. We checked that the quantities A0 and A2 uh, are reproduced um, or reproduce the continuum case. Or again, A0 is this volume of the manifold given in terms of the metric, and A2 is proportional to the Einstein Hilbert action the metric. Uh, through the course of this project, I also checked, or we also checked the heat kernel expansion for fuzzy CP3 and fuzzy S1, which is constructed from fuzzy S2, and checked that these did in fact match the continuum uh, case. Some possible future work. Um, you can look at topological changes from the, in the heat kernel expansion on fuzzy spaces by considering the formations of matrices, g from um, fuzzy S2 to fuzzy T2, uh, from the fuzzy sphere to your fuzzy torus. And also consider heat kernel expansion on more general fuzzy spaces um, based on the correspondence between Poisson brackets and commutators. But also build a dynamical model uh, 
that it uses Euclidean gravity in the narrow ten limit based on the thermal expansion. And this would be uh, probably the main goal, um, but it's uh, much more difficult for you to be considering uh, how changing high values of the LV operator would correspond to some perturbation of the metric. And that's my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Well, thank you very much, Gideon, for that. a very clear presentation. Um, does anyone have questions? Well, no. Uh, also, be great. Uh, I had a question maybe on like slide. Uh, okay, you know, it's a bit further back. Uh, again, again, maybe it was more like 10. <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> uh, yeah, so there was the global coordinates. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you went to the local coordinates to talk about the passing or the, the low pass of planning operator. Mm -hmm. And that's what you then used to talk about the inferno and everything. Uh, I was wondering, what, was there some problem with using the global coordinates to do the same calculation? Um, I think the calculation is just uh, easier to do this way. Um, it's the same for the case of. Um, fuzzy S2 and or the two sphere. Uh, if I first described in terms of the global coordinates, you know, X1, X2, and X3, then I gave the metric in terms of theta and phi, which are uh, restricted to the manifold, I suppose. They, and I think that's the case here as well. We just want to restrict it to the manifold. Um, I think it kind of removes a degree of freedom. It's uh, a bit simpler. Okay. That, that's my understanding. But anyway. Yeah. Yeah, Any other question? Yeah. 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 So in this case, is it because it's easier to use the local coordinates or what can they? Yeah, I think, yeah, in that case, in the case of local coordinates, uh, the IEN is on much more uh, established. That's why you just uh, focus on the local text. So, okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. How do you uh, find this for the onto attention? Can I give you a that it's a non computer like a non way of producing like M average for approximately? Sorry, can you repeat that question because we it didn't come across clearly on the is it how you, uh, on it the algebra matrices corresponding to it? Sorry, the, the speaker is too far from the microphone, so we can't uh, yeah, hear I, the I question. The question is how do you um, formulate the algebra of matrices which corresponds to the algebra functions on the uh, regular space. Um, okay. I'm not sure. I have not uh, really uh, do it in this project, but I know when looking at the Poisson brackets of the Poisson brackets of the global coordinates on it, um, they usually satisfy some algebra, um, like the S2 case, the Poisson bracket uh, satisfies the SU2 algebra. So you try to uh, make matrices which uh, also satisfy this SU2 algebra on the case, which is uh, established in the same for CP2. Um, the coordinates on regular CP2 uh, satisfy this SU3 algebra case. And then I think you just try and construct matrices which also uh, satisfy this SU3 algebra. And these are well studied well, uh, no. the algebras. So it's Usually, it's Sorry, uh, Killian, maybe I will answer the question. Killian, le le perhaps you're, let me just answer the question for the, the this person because um, it's been far beyond uh, the scope of this project. What you do is uh, if you show your slide with P on it, P trace of P times X. Um, yes, uh, the, if you take, you know, to XA being trace of P times X, 
if you take the product of two matrices, trace of P times the product of two matrices, or the star product on the functions that you get there, that star product in the large n limit goes over to the commutative algebra. And that's very controlled. And it's a standard way of extracting the commutative algebra from the large n limit of this matrix algebra in that setting. Once you have P and you, you have your matrices, you, you don't need to do anything special with matrices to do that. Okay. Just, uh, I wanted, there was just one small point because uh, I think there's a few. There was another question. A question. Okay, I just wanted uh, to clarify. If you go to your first transparencies, please, uh, Gillian. Which, which slide, sorry? Uh, your very first one, either one or two or three, maybe. When you introduce the heat kernel expansion, you use a rather uh, unusual convention because I, uh, next, go to the next one. Forward. Yes, here. Mm -hmm. um, the expansion, I believe, is not t to the minus d. Those powers are just. My recollection is that it's d minus two over two, which is Boyle's theorem, and uh, d d minus probably minus four over two. It even goes down by it changes by one to the uh, the leading d is just it's off by a little bit. I think, I think now, it's d over two. Uh, I mean, the kind of key, uh, we define it as a, a two-dimensional manifold because it just gets rid of um, a factor of a, a half in uh, these expressions. Oh, I see. Oh, excellent. Okay, I missed that. Yeah, very good. All right, thank you for clarifying. Uh, let's, so if there are no further questions, we should move on to the next topic. Yeah. Sorry, Takaki, you're not really edible. I don't think that you. Okay, there is a problem. And basically, for simple manifold or for contact manifold, the variance of the dimension is very simple. Because simple manifold is a kind of generator to generate of structural properties. And we can use the method of contagion for the structural space. So, constructing the space spaces is closely related to the so called generator contagion. Yeah. So, total ultimate space is very uh, is corresponding to the uh, space of finite dimension space of which the matrix is in the case of space. Mm -hmm. So the hardest space is a kind of quantum compact space. Yeah, you can see that. So in the case of such uh, particular words, uh, manifold we can consider as a project of the project. Okay. So, are there any questions? And is there something you put a multiplicity in the of the operator? Um, I don't think so. I think it's just um, it has some uh, on chip and off put it operator so you can have the like mm -hmm. they have this um this multiplicity. Is it to um symmetry or the like where you have them Sorry to interrupt the, the conversation, but it, it, I don't think that it's it, the quality is, is not good enough to be recording it. So I think we should postpone this discussion until after the talks. If that's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah.
just one other small point. The camera angle is very strange. Um, if it's possible to tilt it a little bit better towards, it's looking upwards. <laughs> The, the one you are what at at the moment, Takaki. If you can tilt the camera angle a little bit, it would be much better. Is that sorry? Okay. Can you, Nietzsche, can you tilt the camera angle a little bit? Oh, which one? The one that you're looking at. That's the one that is being recorded from. A little more, even. This picture? Uh, yeah, because it's, and even a little more. Because when someone is standing up, it's looking very much up into their chin. Okay. Oh. Okay. okay. Okay, just double check we're not mute. Can everyone hear? Okay, and okay, the, so, uh, hi everyone. I'm Nicole. Hi. And over the last two months, we've been learning the basic theory and the application of supersymmetric quantum mechanics. Um, so this is just a brief overview of what we're going to be talking to you today about. Um, so just to give an introduction, um, the standard model is our current best uh, description of what's going on in the universe, and it's an incomplete theory. So supersymmetry is an extension of the standard model, and it helps to solve some of the problems that lie with it. So there are many known symmetries in the universe, most notably the speed of light being the same in all frames of reference. Um, so if we consider supersymmetry, this is a symmetry which predicts a supersymmetric partner for every particle in the standard model. So in a supersymmetric system, for every fermion, there exists a boson of the same mass. So one of the problems that this solves in the standard model is the finite mass for each boson. So as said, it predicts a supersymmetric partner for every particle, but these particles cannot be detected, and or they can be detected at very high energies, at about maybe 100 giga electron volts. Um, this project consists of Bailey algebra, which is a symmetric algebra, which closes under commutation and anti-commutation relations. So the objective of this project is to understand the basic theory and application of supersymmetry, or SUSY for short. Um, we're going to be doing this by solving Schrodinger's equation and using the techniques of supersymmetry and applying this to various full study potentials, such as the harmonic oscillator, the hydrogen ion potential, and it can be seen that this can this method can be applied to various other arbitrary potentials. So we'll be starting off with the determinant of Schrodinger equation. So we assume the ground state energy is zero, and if it's not at zero, we can always rescale it by subtracting the energy from the potential. So we have our v1 variable there, which is that arbitrary potential. Our h1 is defined by the following ansatz, which is a dagger a. So you can see this in out. And um, in this case, we're just going to say a is that annihilation of uh, annihilation operator acts on the ground state is zero. So if this is true, this will satisfy the Schrodinger equation, and from this we can obtain the potential, which is our W of X. So we're going to define a new operator now, H2, by conjugating H1, and this is H2 is equal to A dagger. So if we multiply this out, we can see this takes the form of a new Hamiltonian uh, with a corresponding potential of V2, which is given on the slide here. Um, so if the super potential is known, we either have one of two cases. Uh, the A operator applied to size 0 of 1 is equal to 0, which size 0 of 1 corresponds to H1 Hamiltonian, and or A dagger applied to size 0 of 2, where size 0 of 2 corresponds to H2 Hamiltonian is equal to 0. And the corresponding size 0 is are given by this formula here. 
where the minus sign comes with the a operator and the plus sign with the a value. And that psi zero equation is obtained by rearranging your equation for the super potential on the previous slide. So only one of these two parameter systems can have a normalizable zero energy ground signal. And we can determine which one it is by studying the uh, what happens to W of X as X tends to infinity. And this section shows how the, the first Hamiltonian is related to the second Hamiltonian. So we can see the first one there is A dagger A. So by applying the annihilation operator, we can get A, A dagger, which is the second Hamiltonian. And as you can see there, we have E of N, Psi N, E of N, and A Psi of N. So that shows that E N, they both have the same eigenvalues. And if you look at this diagram over here, we can see how, uh, say from the right side, which is one system, we can bring that over to the parameter system by applying the creational operator, which is A dagger. And we can have it go the other way by applying the animation, which is the A dagger, which is just the A sorry. And notice that all the energy states are paired up except the ground state, because we cannot have more than um, one ground state with zero energy. So uh, we can look at uh, the construction of a partner system by taking the example of the hydrogen atom. So if we take the time independent Schrodinger equation and we split it into its radial and angular components, uh, we can get a radial Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom potential of the following form, which when we make this substitution here, that U of R is equal to R times the radial character. So then for simplicity, we're just going to take all the constants to be one, and the Hamiltonian we get by doing this, we're going to denote H hydrogen L, which you can see that in use down below. So then, um, since we know that the potential is a function of the super potential, we can make a guess for it and compare it to the potential we have above for the hydrogen atom. So we get a working uh, solution, guess solution here, uh, W of L, and this works for all the values of L. That we can use this to find the creation of violation operators, and we can use that to define two Hamiltonians, uh, H1 of L, which is our H hydrogen of L plus a constant, which is our ground state energy, and then likewise for our partner Hamiltonian H2 of L, which is H hydrogen of L plus one plus constant. So once we've obtained the potential, we can find the ground state. So the first equation there shows the ground state with the constant with the, the value there is uh, after normalization. And after that, we can get the radial component, which is an eigenstate of the hydrogen atom with the eigen energy level of one over four L plus one squared. Uh, the two system, the Hamiltonian is related to the hydrogen atom by the integer of L. So the partner system would be the Hamiltonian of L plus one. So if we find in that system L plus two, we can correspond that to the first system. So the Hamiltonian has a ground state of zero energy for all of L, so we can obtain the excited states by using this formula. So we apply the creational, the creational operator onto the ground state to find the first excited state, and we can find the second excited state by applying it onto the first state. And similarly enough, we can do that for the renal component with the Eigen and with the with the energy value and so on for all the eigenstates. The next slide will show a few of the results that we obtained while doing the calculations. Yeah, so if we follow the method of the previous slides to calculate our excited states, we get the following um, excited states for the real component. Um, so these can be seen to match the uh, if we use the traditional method to calculate our excited states, we get the exact same. Uh, Mm -hmm. components so we know where that is working and we can get the corresponding energies as well so we know the supersymmetry is useful in this case so now i'm going to talk to you about the concept of shape invariance so if we subtract our two partner potentials from each other we get a function of dw dx so we can see here if dw dx is a constant then the partner potentials only differ by a constant and this condition we refer to as shape invariance um, in this case, we have that A and A dagger behave like annihilation creation operators. Um, so the general shape, the general form of the shape invariant potential is given in the middle of the slide here. And we can look at a case where the potential isn't shape invariant. So if we look at the infinite square well potential, we have V1 is the constant, V2 is a function of X, 
So if we look at our general form above, we see it's not a shape invariant potential. Then if we attempt to use our A dagger operator to calculate our excited state, we get a uh, first excited state equal to zero. We know this is untrue if we try to do the traditional method, we get a non-zero at first excited state. So in this case, we have A and A dagger don't behave like creation annihilation operators. So this method is not useful in this case. I'm sorry, just to note, there is a typo after cosec. It should be pi x squared over A, not over x. Now I'm going to talk about the conditions for supersymmetry. So we're going to take the first and second Hamiltonian and combine them into a single Hamiltonian. And then we'll have the symmetry generators Q and Q dagger as shown. Now, the first thing we do is check for any symmetry in the system. So we find if the Hamiltonian and its operators commute to equal to zero, and then the operators act on the ground state equal to zero. For a supersymmetric system, we have Q, Q dagger plus Q dagger Q is equal to the Hamiltonian. And then we have Q and Q dagger anti commutation, which gives the Hamiltonian. This shows that they are fermionic generators. Now, explicit breaking is when the Hamiltonian and its operators, operators do not commute. So it's not equal to zero. This is one of the first things we check. For spontaneous breaking, it's when they do equal to zero, but then the operators do not equal zero when acting on the ground stage. So wind index is a useful tool that we, should, we can use to study supersymmetry breaking in a system. So we define it by delta is equal to a trace of minus one to the f, where f is a fermion number, which is just the number of fermions in your system. So um, minus one to the f has eigenvalues of plus or minus one. Um, as we see, when f is equal to zero, we have a bosonic system, and applying minus one to the f to it gives us an eigenvalue plus one. And likewise for the fermionic system, f is equal to one, we get the minus one eigenvalue. So in our convention that we're using here, h1 is the bosonic partner with eigenvalue plus one, and h2 is the fermionic partner with eigenvalue minus one. So then in any supersymmetric system, we have one non-paired state with a ground state energy of zero. Uh, we saw this a couple of slides back on the diagram. This gives us a Witten index of one. So then we can say that for broken supersymmetry, we have a Witten index of zero. And for unbroken supersymmetry, the Witten index, Witten index is non-zero. So then if we consider that Q annihilates our ground state, we can write a general ground state for the two systems in the following form at the bottom of this slide. And that is true for any system that would be a supersymmetry. Uh, next, in, we're going to talk about the harmonic oscillator, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with, but you give the potential at the top of the screen. And I'm going to talk to you about the bosonic. So we have the following concepts again. So we have A dagger and A, such that um, this section here, N plus a half, gives us six, the energy states, where N is the number operator. And if psi is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian with energy E, that means that A is an eigenstate with energy E minus H bar omega. Similarly, A dagger would be E plus H bar omega. So since this is true, we have A behaving as an annihilation operator. So once again, we're applying the annihilation operator onto the ground stage to equal zero. And a stage with n number of particles can be given by applying the creational dagger on the ground stage. So now we can consider a fermionic harmonic oscillator. So if we take two new um, annihilation and creation operators defined by AF and AF dagger, and we consider the fact that all fermions obey the Pauli exclusion principle, which states two identical fermions can't occupy the same energy level, we can put this in a mathematical form by saying that the second excited state, which would be given by AF dagger applied twice to the ground state, is zero because it doesn't exist. And this is satisfied if AF dagger anti commutes with itself. And then just to close the algebra, we're going to say that AF dagger anti commuting with AF is equal to one. So we're left with a Hilbert space with two states, zero and one. Then we can define a new number operator for this case, nf is equal to af dagger times af. So obviously this can only take value zero or one. And then we define a new Hamiltonian for the fermionic case, which is hf defined at the bottom of the slide here. So then we can combine our two systems uh, by simple addition. 
This gives us a supersymmetric um, Hamiltonian for the combined uh, fermionic and bosonic harmonic oscillator. And you can see that at the top of the slide here. So now we have a new states N, B, and F, where N, F is the number of fermions, which is 0, 1, and N, B is the number of bosons, which is in the arbitrary integer. And for an even number of fermions in a system, it behaves as the of a bosonic system. Similarly enough, if there was an odd number of fermions, it behaves like a fermionic system. So we have this symmetry generators. Q takes a bosonic state to a fermionic state, whereas Q dagger does the opposite. So bosonic is fermionic. And then the excited states can be calculated in a similar manner as the hydrogen atom by applying the creational dagger on the ground state. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you very much, Nicole and Connor. Um, and are there questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah thank you very much. Um, so earlier on, like uh, maybe one of the one of the slides in one of the first sections, you said there would be one ground state with energy zero. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I maybe missed what the the reason it was yeah so um so we have our size here at the bottom here right and um that's given by the exponent exponential of uh this function here so we want the uh, ground state wave function to go to zero at infinity so um for that to occur we want uh w of x to go to well we'll say for the first case here we have a size zero is equal to zero we have the minus sign so we want w of x to go to infinity as x goes to infinity. Um, so equivalently, that would be like saying that dw dx is greater than zero. And for um, say dw dx is less than zero, that corresponds to the second case here where a dagger size zero would be with zero. Um, so if we basically just calculate dw uh, dx for a system and we see if it's greater or less than zero, then we know which operator is acting as the annihilation operator and which is acting as the creation operator. And then we just go from there. So the, the, there's something in that, like where you relate the, the W or DW by the X back to like the, the energy. Yeah. And in one case, you know, your data one is different to the other. And then you set a bottom to the zero. Is that the. Yeah, we can't have. Um... So um, here in the next question, what they're saying is that based on like how double behaves at x plus your infinity, only one of those functions can be normalized with it. Like either with the minus or the plus. Both of them can be normalized with the same point. Oh right, okay. So so, so you get a so you can so solve for a zero eigenvalue. Uh, function of the yeah. differential equation, but okay, yeah, and that's like essentially like the first case is true if e w d x is greater than zero, and the second case is, is true if e w d x is less than zero, right? Okay, yeah, you can calculate that and see which is the correct one, yeah, yeah. Now, you're explaining what good is the base you're acting on, is it now two cross two two cross one? I don't know. You, you, you have you have the, the fermion together with. Oh, the yeah. yeah. This is when we have the two states combined, is it? Yeah. So that's so what is it? And and we you can tell the there there as well. What is the Hilbert space? I assume here it was L two just on the moment. Because at this point there was no, you didn't have the fermionic properties. Yeah. yeah. So what what does that mean with this, this uh, supersymmetry then? Um, I think there's a slightly different meaning in this case. I only know that from the fact that it's easy to carry on. So in this case, in this case, right now we are just talking about two partner systems, and we are just calling these to be like here. Uh, we are not actually. Talking about bosons and fermions in that sense, we are just constructing two partner systems. And since in like two, as partner, two, partner. two partner systems, two so partner. 
H1 and H2, they are constructing, and like as we saw in the case of harmonic oscillator, that if we combine the harmonic and quadratic system, it is like a similar kind of quantum system. So, in some cases, we can explicitly see that one of the systems is actually bosonic and the other one is fermionic. But here, they are not talking about boson and fermionic specifically. It's just a construction of two quantum systems, which they are calling the supersymmetric system. <laughs> and then, so there is no question on fermions at all. In this, in, at this point, I don't think yeah. so. And with the other case, then. So that is an ultimate possibility. Yeah. I thought that possible, yeah. Because they, in that case, you basically had bosonic energy levels. And for every bosonic energy level, you had two options, which was the, the fermionic one. Yeah. So the bosonic ones, you could just map for the L2 basis functions in by your L2. You didn't have any spinner levels. I sorry, what was that? What was the question? You didn't have any spinners. That was the state of the question. Okay. No. Well, that's two two part of this two dimensional space. That's the second external term. So it's just a few that you go a little further. When you combine the system, like there is a, you know, when you just combine the two partner systems, yeah. now when you combine the two systems, for maximum. Yeah. Yeah, so here it's, it's the last side. So they are constructing these two partner systems and they can be like combined into one system such that we can define two new generators which are anti commuting And if we write the states of this system and then we can see that we will have two different kind of states one corresponding to H1 and another corresponding to H2, and the application of these operators will take from one kind of state to another kind of state. So at this point, we are not explicitly talking about bosons and fermions. It's just a kind of symmetry that we can observe from this construction. It's a great response to yeah. 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 So this is also from what we were talking before. So you know, this is how we more general way that people think about supersymmetry, like mm -hmm. you know, that's not really the call right. certain systems supersymmetric, but they just have yes, two levels. Yeah. 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 yeah, but it's not actually a visual analysis, it doesn't involve the I mean, Wigan's original paper on supersymmetry in this theory goes through all this in other ways, and it's clearly the underlying idea. It's very far from, for example, it describes the most of this. And much more than other mm -hmm. types of methods. Well, were there any spinners that would be? There are some spinners, but the, the gradient is not going to be lower and it actually forms all of you, or any strong kind of things, you can just be a really visual mm -hmm. space and uh, spectrum to the two bits or double or double. We can just do also control to this method. If you wanted to, but there's no real you know, reason. I mean, there's nothing on the situation again. Well, that's not that to be some naturalness. Yeah, well, with the around spin of its four dimensions. Yeah, but if, if you don't have really much space, you can't do it. Maybe just, just one question. Where, where would you take the project from here? Um, there's kind of two different versions. So we can apply it to further complicated systems, or we can, since we have the basic understanding of the supersymmetry in quantum mechanics, we can take this further into a field theory. Yeah, there's like a paper that we uh, were looking at where you, they, there's this very large arbitrary potential, um, which um, the conditions of supersymmetry will apply to. And um, it, you, can, you can basically just like, 
takes action to that and apply this technique to various different potentials which are on the front of that uh, potential. So um, if you could take a look at that, or we could take a look at that paper and like just expand on that for me. And and did you check uh, for broken supersymmetry in any of these ones? Did you um, did you calculate the Witten index? Uh, we have in some of the calculations you were given. Um, yeah. Yeah, we have in some calculations. Yes. And did you find anything interesting? Uh, was supersymmetry like broken or not broken in these systems? Well, I, I, it should be broken in the uh, infinite square law case, but I don't remember checking it. Okay. Yeah. So all the cases that it wasn't broken, then yeah, we're good. Yeah. Okay, I think we should probably move on because the quality of sound from the discussion is is not great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. And next, we are going to hear from. Ralph Jason Costellis and Ali Gunning. So let's. So is there a question in the chat? And they're going to tell us about time evolution. Or is there a question in the chat? Uh, I don't see any question in the chat, no. No, I think that's just an old message. And we have Ben and Tian from last year joining us. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm Ali, and this is my colleague Ralph Jason. And this summer we did our project on the time evolution for finals quantum computer uh, under Tony. So just to start with a bit of background for anyone unfamiliar with quantum computing, we can start with these two state systems called qubits. Now, unlike a classical bit that either takes the value of zero or one, these qubits are going to be a linear superposition of the zero state and the one state, where I've seen here, they're from, they belong in the two-dimensional Hilbert space. Now, using these qubits, we can represent any n-dimensional number by a state of a register, where an n-dimensional number is going to be a quantum entanglement of n qubits, and we belong to the two to the n dimensional Hilbert space. Now, using these registers, we can complete any quantum computation on them, where you'll have an input state, and the final state at the end is going to be the answer to our computation. Now, how this computation is going to be done is using these operators, which we call the U's, that are going to be elementary or unit unitary operators. And the two to the n by two to the n matrix, where n here is going to be k plus one, that will be needed to achieve the same goal as these operators, we're going to call G. And it's going to be a product of UK all the way on to U1, where these U's are going to be simple matrices that act on our N register of atoms here. So the way that we're going to evolve our state from the initial state to the final state is using this time evolution equation, where our output state at a specific time is given by this equation, where psi in is going to be the input state for a system with Hamiltonian H, and we've let H bar equals to one for convenience. Now we can let our time evolution operator, our unitary operator here, be equal to G, where G is this product of our uh, user uh, operators. And throughout our project, we're going to use a Taylor expansion on this time evolution operator. So instead of having the operator acting on science, we'll have the Hamiltonian acting of a new amount of times, once, twice, three times, and so forth. So now using all of these elements, we're able to come up with Feynman's quantum computer. So what Feynman did is he added to our n atoms in our register, this new set of k plus one atoms that he called the program counter or the clock space, which is shown here. So just to show how it works, we'll start off in our first state, which is going to be our one state. And a good way of thinking of this is as an electron that jumps from one empty side to another, 
where we're going to call the occupied sites the one state and the unoccupied sites the zero state. So starting from this state, we can move to the second state by then moving from a zero site occupied to a second site occupied. And as this occurs, the first operator U1 will act on some subset of the M atoms in a register. We'll then move from the second state to the third state, we'll move from uh, the first site being occupied to the second site being occupied, and then U2 will be applied to some subset of the M atoms. We'll eventually reach a point where we move from the K state to the N state, where N again is K plus one. And we're going to move from the K minus one site being occupied to the final K site being occupied. And at this point, our final operator, our UK, will act on the M atoms in a register, meaning our computation is complete as all of the operators have been applied. So for Feynman's quantum computer, we make the claim that if we evolve by some way from our initial state to our final state or end state, then the computation will be complete because our UK operators have acted on the system. Now, the way we're going to jump from one of these states to the next is using this annihilation and creation operators QI and QI dagger, where I represent them acting on the i site. Now, what the annihilation operator is going to do is it's going to convert an occupied site to an unoccupied site, and an unoccupied site it will reduce to nothing. The creation operator is going to convert an occupied site into an unoccupied site, and an occupied site it will reduce to nothing. So, using all of these elements, we're able to form Feynman's Hamiltonian, which is very important for our time evolution operator. Now, I think the best way to explain how this works is by an example. So, myself and Ralph started with Feynman's Hamiltonian for k equals two, and there's going to be two operators, u1 and u2, and we're going to add to the n atoms in our register a new set of three atoms, which will define our clock space as shown here. So we'll start in our, in our first state, our initial state, and we'll act our Hamiltonian on it, which is given here. Now, the only term of this Hamiltonian that can actually operate is the first term here, where the annihilation operator will act on the zero site, converting it to an unoccupied site, and the creation operator will act on the first site, converting it to an occupied site. And as this occurs, our first operator, U1, will act on the M atoms in our register. If the Hamiltonian was then applied again to the second state, the only term that can operate is the second term here, where annihilation operator will convert the first site to an unoccupied site, and the creation operator will convert the second site to an occupied site. As this occurs, the second operator, U2, will act on our M register in our atom. And as we've seen here, we're now in our final state, and U2 and U1 have been applied, showing that the computation is complete and this Hamiltonian will work. So what we then wanted to do is start looking at the time evolution operator. So we wanted to convert our Hamiltonian into a matrix form by this series of tensor products from our equation two. And we were then able to get this final Hamiltonian here. Now, what this large Hamiltonian is actually, it's a combination of two independent clock spaces. One is going to be a program counter where one side is occupied for all time. And the second is a program counter where two sites are occupied for all time. And for our computer, we're only going to consider a program counter with one site occupied. So we can separate out this into a simpler matrix seen here as H. Now, for this matrix, we were able to establish two relations seen in five and six here, which are very useful for our Taylor expansion of the time evolution operator because we were, like, we were able to substitute them in and then we were able to group together all of our terms in terms of H and H squared. Now, what you see in the brackets one and two here were actually just the Taylor expansions of cos and sine with different coefficients. So we were able to substitute this here in equation nine and get a final matrix form for our GAT or our time evolution operator as shown in line 10 here. Now, what's so important about getting this matrix is that the whole point of looking at this time evolution operator is to see how efficient Feynman's quantum computer would be. Now, when I use the word efficient, I mean, what will be the probability of computation completion? So for Feynman's computer, we want to work out if we start in this initial state, what will be the probability that if we check at a specific time, which we'll call the optimal time, that the computation will be complete? Now, we know that if we find ourselves in the final state, which in this case we call the current state, the pre state, that all the operators have been applied. So the probability that we can get this is if we start off on our initial state and apply a time evolution operator, we were going to work out the probability that it ends up in this final state. What this also corresponds to is the one three element of our matrix G of T, which is shown here. So we can extract this out and then get the probability amplitude by getting the absolute value squared. And this will cancel out the unitary operators and we'll be left with that coefficient there. So we're going to try and maximize this as we want the maximum probability that it will complete. This is going to attack a period of time t equals pi over root two with a probability of excessive unity. So this is going to be the only case when we, if we check at this time, we have a hundred percent chance that the computation will be complete. We then move on to work for k plus three to see if we can spot some patterns that could generalize to larger k. 
This is our Hamiltonian here, and using the same method, we were able to separate at our Hamiltonian with only one side occupied, as shown in, shown in 13. We were able to establish the following relations based on this Hamiltonian that are shown here, which again we used in our Taylor expansion for E to the minus I H T. We grouped together the terms by, by the density matrix H, H squared, and H cubed. And although they were familiar to the cause and sign Taylor expansion, their coefficients were different. And we actually realized they were the even terms of the Fibonacci sequence, which we were able to then substitute in. However, we wanted to create a general formula that whose output would be the numbers of the Fibonacci sequence itself. So we tried to use a generating function to do this. Now we define the generating function as shown, and by using the relationship between the Fibonacci numbers, which is that each term is the addition of the two previous terms, it was able to be shown that the Fibonacci numbers were given this by this equation here for lambda and phi are shown there in 18. <clears throat> so finally, substituting this into our transition operator expansion, we got this final form for our matrix G of T. So again, we wanted to find this probability of computation and completion. So we looked at when the problem parameter had reached its final site, we called the fourth state, and when the end register had been operated by the three operators U3, U2, U1. Now, when we maximized this, we found it occurred at a time T equals 2.810, and the probability of success was 0 0.973, which is if we then check the probe counter at this time, we have a 97% chance that the computation will have completed. So now Jason's going to talk a little bit about how we generalize from larger K using the patterns that we've defined. So I wanted to, we wanted to um, generalize um, all, everything that we've done so far for higher k's because for an actual computer, we're talking about um, operation sizes of about k is equal to maybe 10 to the power 6 and maybe even more. So using the principles that we learned from k is equal to 2 and k is equal to 3, we wanted to first extend um, Hamiltonian to generalize the higher k's. And we saw by induction, we can prove that um, each Hamiltonian um, is a tridiagonal matrix as shown here. And knowing this, we are able to then extend the ideas of a generating function to create these ODEs, um, these nth order ODEs for each K. Um, we created these by looking at the Hamiltonian relationships that we found, as well as the generating function. We are able to create ODEs for our case equal to two, three, four, and so on. And we were then able to generalize this to create any n order ODE that we desired, uh, depending on whether our desired k was even or odd. Um, to solve each ODE, we have to have n plus one initial conditions to solve them. But these are very easily generated because we have that g of t is equal to e to the power minus i h t. Therefore, it was very easy to make an infinite amount of initial conditions, but since we only need n plus one, so we have that. And from our solution, we know that the um, G1n coefficient, which we're interested in, because it tells us when the program counter has completed, um, it's actually solely determined by the coefficients associated with the h to the power um, of the highest uh, order. And so if we differentiate our solution of the ODE by n times, we are actually able to obtain the coefficients of G1n. And by taking the absolute value squared of this, we are able to then find the probability that it will complete at a specific time that we check. So with this, we are actually able to plot the probability that the program counter will have completed at a given time t. And over here, um, I have the, we have the graph for k is equal to 8. Um, but we were able to extend this to up to about k is equal to 30, 31. The, prop, the issue with this is that it is quite a slow um, way of doing it. However, if we were to have any, if we had um, a long enough time, we could generate any arbitrary k that we wanted. So we can see from this graph that the probability here peaks at 0 0.828 at a time 5.583 units for our k is equal to 8 case. And we can notice that the maximum probability that we seem to get seems to decrease from um, our earlier ones from k is equal to what to k is equal to two and k is equal to three. So as I said, uh, while this can get any arbitrary k that we want, it is quite as inefficient as we would have to generate an ODE and then we'd have to solve that ODE and then differentiate it uh, n, n times just to find the, the expression by which we want to plot. So we wanted to look for another method that would straight away give us the uh, what we want, the expression that we needed to plot. So we were working on reducing the Hamiltonian. 
And we can do this because our G of T always follows a certain structure, which can be proven by induction. So we actually know where each of the U1s and the U2s and UKs will show up in our G of T. Therefore, we can actually reduce our Hamiltonian to get an effective Hamiltonian, which is a tri-diagonal symmetric matrix made of zeros and ones. And it follows that this uh, matrix obeys the eigenvalue equation um, given there. And it can be shown that these uh, that this effective Hamiltonian has these uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors given by equation 28. And this allows us to find a relationship to find probability that the program counter, which starts at state one, which is not the qubit state zero one, uh, will eventually evolve into a state n, which is the end of the uh, program counter, which we know that all the operations have now been carried out on our um, system. And so we're able to find a general expression given in equation 29 of uh, G1n. And this allows us to plot much, much higher than just k is equal to 30. Um, we were able to, uh, shown here is the plot of k is equal to 14,999, but we were able to go much higher than that as well um, to about k is equal to 50,000 quite um, efficiently. And we can see here, um, there's some very notable things from this graph. You can see that the probability of completion is actually approximately zero until our first maximum is approached. So that means that there really is no point in checking our program if our program counter has completed up until this optimal time, which, um, as you can see, gets uh, longer and longer the more up, the larger our operation sizes get. So we, since we were able to now find quite um, efficiently the optimal time for a given k, that we should check if uh, the program counter has finished, as well as the probability. We wanted to find if there was a, we wanted to find the relationships between uh, the optimal time and the operation size. And so when this was plotted, we found that the time of completion was actually linearly correlated to the optimal to the number of operations. Uh, and when plotting the probability of completion against operation size, which is the probability that um, the program counter would finish at our optimal time, um, there was an inverse square root relationship. With here. However, we should note that this is only still projected because this is um, based on a fit made um, from earlier points in the graph. There's no, there's no telling just yet if this will continue to, if this relationship will continue to obey itself um, as we go to higher and higher k's, which is the um, k's that we are most interested in because computers will need um, thousands and thousands of operations. So in conclusion, uh, the time of, we uh, studied the time evolution operator of Feynman's quantum computer, first part k is equal to two and three. And using this foundation, we were able to then extend our, um, uh, to create a general formula for the time evolution operator for higher k's using two different methods. A generating formula method, which was very inefficient for time, but was successful. However, you'd need to generate an ODE, which you then have to solve and differentiate. And then a reduced Hamiltonian method, which was much more efficient in producing um, information about our quantum computer um, with regards to very, very high case. Exploring the efficiency of our program, we found that there was a linear relationship between optimal time of completion and an uh, inverse square root relationship is still projected for the probability of computation completion. We seem to be doing better than, say, other quantum computers, such as a maybe vacuum evolving quantum computer, where the probability is related to the operation size by uh, one over k squared. Um, however, we are hoping to, in the future, um, extend to higher k's so that we would be able to more rigorously um, be confident that um, we are actually observing an inverse square root relationship between the probability of computation completion and uh, time and um, operation size. Sorry. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for an excellent presentation again. Um, and questions. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, thanks, Ken. And yeah, just a couple of slides back when you were talking about the tendencies on the probability and the completion time with number of steps k. Um, uh, yeah, just these, these figures. Yeah. So, um, from what you said, it sounds like the probability of completion, uh, the max probability that we'll ever see, is going down with case 
Okay, so like right there, it's like, uh, oh yeah, it's one, uh, one, one zero five zero one two. Yeah. Yeah. So if you wait, the you know the best you could ever get would be one in a hundred chance that yeah. You can Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, so actually, what's not shown here is that it does actually um go up again. Um, if you wait um a later time, um, it's especially noticeable in for lower case that um after waiting a certain amount of time, you do actually observe that the probability goes back up. However, we haven't yet um analyzed uh or made rigorously a relationship to show um just how periodic this um. Elevation back to the higher probabilities would be. And oh, does it come back to one? Um, no, no. no um, as, as, K, as you said, as K increases, the probably will always decrease. Yeah. As our kind of ground chart. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so, the other one is the, the linear dependence of you. So here you're plotting where you find that max probability. You're finding that. What team was that? Yeah. Yeah. That's probably okay. Um, what's the slope there? Is it something like? Um, we're not certain we don't have an exact value for that slope. For the first level, it's just going to be exactly because it's, you know, that's the best route is you just act with all the right operations in the right order, and then you get to this. But then maybe you know, there's some sort of uh, quantum random walk where you're, you're, you're going the right direction, you come back, and then you. Yeah. So actually, with the, the program time, yeah, so with the program time that we have, the, we have to add into the how to do the complex conjugate to make it permission. And what that does is actually, instead of always moving forward, you can also jump backwards in the program counter. Yeah. So you won't just naturally, once you arrive to the end state, you can also go back again. Right. Oh. Okay. Um, so, more of a then there's probably other people. <laughs> Um, yeah, oh yeah, I was going to ask, did you look at the integrated probability because uh, you you presumably would like to know uh, the total probability when the total probability reaches maybe ninety nine percent. If I integrate from Quinit from around your eight thousand in your graph. Yeah. Um, for here. What? Um, yes. So how far? Um, how far forward would I have to go before I would be guaranteed that there was a very good chance that it had finished? So, um, actually, what this graph is saying is that it's not that. Um, so we have. So if we want to check, say the program has finished at like say t is equal to seven thousand five hundred. Um, like if that pro that probability will start to decrease. So that means if we check the program calendar at another time. So. I believe to get an integrated probability, we'd have to continue to check that. Yes, um, exactly. Yes. Yeah. However, um, to to know that then that, that means um, we'd have to be able to more accurately define when, say, um, we'd have to know better when the um, when the probability start to repeat and, and such. Um, but we have we've only so far looked so far at the first at the first optimal time, and instead of um, and so that means that for now, with this, with what we've done, um, you'd have to reset the program counter back to um, zero, essentially. Yeah. Okay. So yes, we saw that there were sub subsidiary peaks later, and those are the ones you're defining as this, the, the next repeat times. Yeah. Next optimal um, times. Yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah. If not, the discussion is is not recorded very well. So if uh, um, I maybe have another question from the audience, um, yeah. please. Uh, so you were able to get the closed forms of say the max probability or that t as a function of a, which is which by doing these numerical plots. Yeah, you were able to get like nice analytic expressions. No, for them. that would be the next. Step. How doable is that? That next step, you know, when you were doing it. <laughs> um, so we started to look into the um, kind of inside of a general sum and integral to, but our understanding is quite limited at the moment. Um, I think it's not as simple as we would hope because of some of the signs in our formula cancelling out each other. <laughs> That's in any way right. The only probably can explain a lot better. But yeah, so we, that is the next step in, yeah. in finding out how to. Um, by yeah. instead of treating it as a song, we treat it as an integral now. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. To get a general form in class. Yes. Okay, thanks.
It's a good question. No, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you all for uh, for some excellent presentations, and uh, we will give you a round of applause for everyone. And I'm going to stop the recording at this point. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Yes.